too much background. And we'll get started in a second. Okay. Okay. I guess that's the best. Oh, maybe I'll do it this way. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. And welcome to another edition of Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashida. I have a very special guest. She's no stranger to the community. Uh, wow, how many, about 100% of people know her? <laughs> Maybe a small percentage may not know her. But um, I want to introduce everyone to Dr. J. Mack and Dr. J. Good evening and welcome to the nice program. And thank you so much for having me, Mr. Omar. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. All right. All right. So um, let's just start off. Uh, with, with your background, for those who, who may not know you, um, just give a background of um, who you are. Um, you know, you're, 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 you're a doctor, you have a doctor's degree, you're a reverend. So let's let's talk about your education first. Uh, let's talk about um, your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, and, and your doctoral degree. All right. Well, I am a native, uh, born and raised in West Virginia, came to Delaware, and uh, from the time I was eight years old, I went to Wilmington Public Schools, went to Delaware State College, University of Delaware, Wilmington College, you name it, <laughs> and the uh, Jameson School of Theology and Ministry in Philadelphia. And so I have a bachelor's in secondary education and poli-sci and um, master's in um, theology education and PhD in theology education. And I have been a teacher. I started my own homeschool in Delaware uh, in the 90s and early 2000. And um, that is a little piece of what I have been uh, doing all these years of long life. <laughs> okay. Now, now most people may not know what they may sometimes forget. You know, when you put the doctor in front, sometimes they may may forget that that you're also a reverend. So, how how that come about? I am. Well, actually, I was called into the ministry, and I've been an ordained and licensed minister since 1990. Mm -hmm. I am a part of a worldwide ministry uh, from Columbus, Ohio, and I was ordained by Reverend Dr. Uh, Rod Parsley. You may know him. He's a worldwide ministry, one of the biggest ministries in the United States. Uh, most of my family are from Ohio. Okay. on my mother's side and uh, I became the area director uh, for that ministry in Delaware in the uh, 90s and eight, um, 2000. So that is my story. And then of course I went to uh, college in Philadelphia for the um, doctorate of theology and um, just stayed at it until I finished. Right. And so I do have that uh, background. So a lot of people don't know, but I've also pastored for many, many years. Right. Even before uh, people knew it, I was pastoring probably in the early 90s. And um, so my, my, my background in history is so varied and, and broad. Uh, right. I can't even begin to share it all. Okay, okay. Well, you, you can get people some, some pieces and bits. So that, that's good. They, they get to the take of, of who you are <laughs> and how you got started. Uh, Stop the Violence Coalition. You, that, that was your baby uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, you were you're involved in that organization for, for a very long time. Uh, what is Stop the Violence Coalition? How did you get started? And what are some of the things that you do in the community? Uh, Stop the Violence Coalition started in uh, really after a little boy 
five-year-old was shot and killed in the barbershop uh, in the crossfire, the target of the shooters was actually a 21-year-old. Um, and from the outcry of the community, uh, many groups became involved, but Pastor Pravi Powell, he wasn't a pastor then, but he was very much uh, an integral part of starting Stop the Violence Coalition, along with a host of others, Reverend Ty Johnson, IMAC, uh, our Interdenominational Ministers Action Council, um, the community at large, our government, state, uh, federal, and, and uh, city government, the mayor, uh, at that time, James Baker, I believe it was, um, you know, it was just an outrage. And so the businesses and everybody wanted to do something about uh, gun violence, uh, especially youth gun violence at that time. And so here we are 20 years in April, we celebrated our 20th anniversary of Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated. And I have been the founding executive director of Stop the Violence Coalition and the founder of the Academy for Peace for 20 years, Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated. Okay, the Academy for Peace, um, located at 203 North Market Street, Wilmington, Delaware, 19801. Um, before we get into the Academy of Peace, um, I want you to talk about the vision, because I know you've probably been contemplating for quite some time in terms of getting the building, name it the Academy for Peace, and then you want to build this building to, to help the community. So, so talk about um, how this vision came about. The Academy for Peace is an outgrowth of Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated. Okay. Of course, we know that violence as we know it probably won't stop, but there are different modalities that we can use to address violence in our community. So in 2017, the vision that I had prior to 2017, actually for a long time, was how do we actually address violence in a way that makes sense? where we can impact the lives of children, youths, and families. And so I started researching uh, peace. And I believe that peace is a person. And I'm not getting religious about it, but mm -hmm. for me, that is the person of Jesus Christ. And so with that, I started thinking about Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi. I started thinking about many of those who had gone before us who had a mind to see peace bring about a nation, a world that really responded to the needs of human beings in a peaceful way. And so that has been my mission with the Academy for Peace. The vision is to see peace become a way of life. Because I personally believe that if we can reach our children at a younger age with a healthy attitude toward general uh, behavior, such as manners, mm -hmm. such as uh, interacting in a calm, peaceful way. And there are ways to introduce that into every setting in our lives. And so the, uh, the Academy for Peace was started with that vision in mind, that we would just promote peace as a way of life. And so we are in the pursuit of peace in everything we do, trying to get people to see that there is a better way, there is another way. Right, right. And I think one of the things that, that can really help the, 
stop the violence is people knowing themselves, you know, knowing their history, knowing their heritage. And you have a program that you currently just started for the summer. Uh, it's, it's about history. It's about, about us knowing our history. Uh, you want to talk about that? Yes, uh, I didn't mention that I am a history teacher, right? So <laughs> I have a natural and a historian uh, and a poet and writer. So with that thought in mind, I wanted to look at a different way of approaching summer camp this year. And so okay. I started looking at ways to do that. And I said, well, I'll just use my gift of teaching writing, speaking, and pull it together in a historical context. And so what we've done is to offer the um, Reach for the Stars History Summer Camp. And of okay. course, that, that is a saying that was attributed to Harriet Tubman. She said that we should reach for the stars, uh, although, some would argue that she said that or not, but it is a quote that is attributed to mm -hmm. her. And so this summer camp is exciting because we're looking at history from the broad perspective of how do we as a people, African-Americans in America, how do we matter? You know, last year it was Black Lives Matter. Well, we matter all the time, but yeah. how do we matter? What does that mean from a historical uh, context? And so what we're looking at is Africans coming to or being brought to this land, why and passage, to this area. And uh, so there were many people involved in Swedish history, Jewish history, right here in Wilmington, Delaware. And so our kids, and I'm finding that some of our kids don't know geography. Oh, yeah. So if they live on the west side, they don't know where the east side is. If they live on the north side, they don't know where the south side is. So history brings all of that into perspective and to view so that the kids can focus on who they are and where they fit into the history of a people. And so it has been excited, exciting. We're on our third day and I'll tell you, it is just exhilarating to see how excited these children are. They are hungry right. after being quarantined, after having to do right. Zoom uh, education. They are excited to be out. We walk every day around the city. We have explored the very places that they hear about in, in movies, such as Harriet, when Harriet Tubman got to Wilmington, Delaware, and she went to the home of Thomas Garrett. Well, where's the home of Th Thomas Garrett? It's right at 4th and Shipley, mm. right where Dell Tech is today. There is a placard there that lets us know that, but how many even of the adults in our city realize that when you are watching Harriet Tubman, the movie Harriet, you're hearing about places in Delaware, the Christina River, as we walk the riverfront, she had to cross the Christina River on her way to Philadelphia Freeland. When she knocked on the door of Mr. Garrett, who was the underground uh, station master, they called him. There was a code that they had to use. It's a friend of a friend because they were Quakers. They were friends. They were abolitionists. And when the slaves escaped and came through Wilmington, they would knock on that door and they would find peace right. and they would find a time of comfort 
from a hard journey. We yeah. even went to um, the statue that's in the Tubman Garrett Park. And of course we yeah. have August quarterly there uh, every year. But how many realize when you're looking at that statue, you see Harriet Tubman being cloaked by Thomas Garrett and Thomas Garrett is holding a lantern, which represents light. But if you look behind Garrett and Harriet, you'll see that there's a couple right. and they're in the water. And you may not realize that is a, a, a river or a body of water that they're climbing through. If you look on the side of that couple, you will see that they've taken off their clothes, their shoes. And I noticed something the other day that there was a bag there that they had to leave everything they had with the hopes of reaching free land. What a thought, right. what a thought. And so the children were able to see many of the things that they could only remember from perhaps a movie, but they hadn't read about it and they had not uh, been able to see this wonderful statue. It's one of my favorite. And it was an eye opener. In well, just know, yeah. looking at, mm -hmm. yeah, not, what not, did you? Interrupt you. Yeah, but um, you know, I'll just listen to you speak. Um, you know, next month, uh, Wilmington, Delaware is going to have the annual Clifford Brown Jazz Festival. And of course, Clifford Brown was a big time a musician here in the city of Wilmington. So, so, so I want to ask you in, in your curriculum, teaching the children, um, are you going to be teaching them about the performing arts, such as artists like Clifford Brown and maybe some of the other like actors, uh, dancers, and things of that nature there? Absolutely. We will be visit, visiting uh, Christina Culture Arts Center. But right. as a part of that, not only will I teach them about Christina Cultural Arts Center, because I was raised on the east side of Wilmington. Okay. I'm a coal miner's daughter. My father brought my mother and, and our family here from West Virginia. He was a coal miner. And when we came here, we landed, if you will, on the east side of Wilmington, which was a beautiful community to live in. It was right there in the home of Swedish history. Right. And I had the privilege, and I really say honor, of being a member of Old Swedes Church, which is the oldest active church in America. 1698, mm -hmm. that church was open. And so through my being there at that church, I learned a lot of history and Swedish history and how that played into Delaware. And guess what? My mother was part of the Jazz at Home Club. Okay. And the Jazz at Home Club was very connected to guess where? The Baby Grand Club. Uh, yeah. And of course, Clifford Brown lived right down the street from the baby grand. Mm. And of course, many of our mothers and dads during that era went to the baby grand. And so a lot of my hearing of my mother, who was a member of the, the uh, Jazz at Home Club was baby grand, Millie Cannon. Millie Cannon was a uh, South Bridge resident who was a jazz singer with Press Johnson. And they used to travel all over the East Coast and beyond. And my mother was their driver. Isn't that something? Oh, wow. So we, awesome. knew Millie, we knew Millie Cannon. We knew Press Johnson. Great musicians. We knew Chat. Uh, at, I can't think of Mr. Chat's last name right now. Somebody in the audience might know, right. but that's how I grew up. So Christina Cultural Arts Center on the east side of Wilmington on Church Street before it moved uptown was okay. the central meeting place 
of not only children, but our parents went there for cooking classes mm -hmm. or Bible study, shipping together for choir practice. And of course, we went there as children to watch the Be Beverly Hillbillies <laughs> Island TV. Now, isn't that something? That's you what know, we Ted, would do. Yeah, we didn't have it. Right. Yeah. And you know, my grandmother told me that, um, I don't know if it was the baby grand or not, but she told me some well-known uh, singers and performers, like I think maybe like James Brown, that they used to come to the city of Wilmington and, and perform. Absolutely. And wow. I saw James Brown when he came to the Armory, which used to be right there where St. Anthony's Senior Housing is okay. on, um, uh, is that Scott Street? Yeah, I think somewhere in Little Italy area. Yeah, so, somewhere yes, there. right area. there where St. Anthony's is. Okay, and yeah. came there, that used to be the armory. And they used to have many artists that came through there for entertainment. And you can just imagine James Brown wow. in Wilmington, Delaware. What a That's crowd. Awesome. And yeah. so I can remember that. Um, there were many, many stars that came through. I can't even begin to name them all because some yeah. of them were... Uh, pre my time, but okay. my mother knew them all because of Millie Cannon and the Cannon family in South Wilmington are still there. And mm -hmm. uh, we honor them as a matter of, matter of fact, the Millie Cannon Park is right there on um, Hill Street. Right. And you know, Dr. J, uh, you, you being a business lady, you taught me many, many courses in, in business, and I was one of your students. <laughs> um, you were one of my students <laughs> long term. I don't know how many classes you took with me. Well, it's always learning, but but I want to know, you know, from, from my grand my grandparents told me that there used to be a lot of ministers in, in the city of Wilmington, African American ministers, and um, you know, when we teach your curriculum about you know the history of entrepreneurs in the African American community. Yes. Well. You know, I am the founder of the Direct Sales and Home-Based Business Network. And of mm -hmm. course, as you said, you took many of my classes. As a matter of fact, you were one of my long-term students. So many, uh, you know, when that came through the Direct Sales uh, and Home-Based Business Network, we were so pleased to have all of our um, classes offered through the Money School, Delaware Financial Literacy, and uh, the library system, Newcastle County Library. And so we were there and so many students came through. This area that we live in, Wilmington, Delaware, was a thriving community on the east side of Wilmington. There were doctors, lawyers, mm. all of our teachers, dentists, manufacturers, people who worked in the manufacturing business, railroad employees, DuPont employees, African-Americans now in beautiful homes. Those townhomes on the east side of Wilmington were beautiful homes and many of them still are. And mm. What happened? I always say it's not what's wrong, it's what happened. And so what happened was urban development. Okay. I'm also a former city planner, worked for two mayors, Mayor McLaughlin and McLoney, as the uh, financial um, federal grants assistant, a city planner, and worked on the riverfront development project. A lot of people don't know these things because I don't go around telling it. It's just there and it's part of my life. I can't deny it. And anybody that want to uh, deny it, they can't deny it either because they know I did it. But right. what you asked about is so true. Many of our families had prominent family members. As a matter of fact, I'll share this with you. One of the books that I'm using in my class 
for okay. the youngsters is called Growing Up Black in Newcastle County. Wow. And it's a com compilation by uh, Dr. Jean Nutter, whom I'm sure many of our viewers and listeners community uh, figure, very prominent. And she compiled this book. And you can get this book, by the way, at Walgreens all oh. over the state. So okay. if you would like to know more about Black history, our history in Newcastle County, in Wilmington, Delaware, it takes you all the way from Wilmington, Claymont, to uh, Middletown, Newark, all the way through Newcastle County, which actually goes to Smyrna. Right. So Dr. Okay. Jay, um, yeah, you know, when we look at our communities, um, you know, people used to say, uh, everybody knew everybody, you leave your doors open. It was peace, it was no shooting. Uh, like you said, you, you had doctors, you had lawyers, you had teachers all living in the community. <clears throat> I mean, it, it, it was a village. The village raised a child. Mm -hmm. 2021, prior to that, <laughs> like a whole different community. So, so well, from being friendly to where we are now today. You know what? I am so pleased. So many wonderful parents. One of the things that we did with Stop the Violence Coalition Incorporated, we agreed that every program that we offered had to have a parental component where the parents were engaged. Many okay. times we have programs that address the issue of our children, but when the children go back home, they are faced with some difficulties and traumatic uh, things that happen and they may get dealt with or they may not be dealt with because the family structure, parents have to be engaged, learning the same things that mm -hmm. the children are learning come to our programs, being engaged in a way that makes sense for them. And so we made a plan that we would always have programs, not only for the children, but engage the parents because we all, I, I just think we all have to be on the same page or else you're disjointed. And so we wanna reach the parents as well. So we do uh, intervention, mediation, and try to reach parents right where they are with the needs that they have that will help build a stronger family. Okay. I hope uh, I answered that question. Yeah, 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 that, that definitely, definitely. Uh, you're going back to, 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 to your history classes, um, what are the age of the students that are attending your classes and how, how long is it going to last? The campus for three weeks. It started this week. As I said, we're going into the end of our first week and it has been dynamic. The children have been enriched and the ages are from five years to 16. Okay. And the 16, 15, excuse me, 14 and 13 year olds, I call them interns. Okay. They are our summer interns. So they are helpers with the program and they learn how to do everything that I do right. as okay. a program director, because we're not just raising up children to be in this program and leave it. We're raising up dynasty. Right. We're building family. Right. We're raising up children who will become prayerfully activists, community uh, engaged people. And so we want them not only to be 
having fun. Yes, that's a part of our program. We have a lot of fun. Anybody that knows me, I'm going to have fun. And so mm -hmm. we want the children to enjoy themselves, but we also want to leave them with Lucy of understanding their heritage. And so our children are five years old up to 16. And the 16 year olds are helpers. They understand that when they come to the program. Okay. So is it too late for students to, to enroll in the, in, the, in the history classes or do they have to wait uh, until next year? They'll have to wait until next year, unfortunately, because okay. we are at our quota. Oh, okay, got you. Be, believe it or not, and I really appreciate this family, there is one family that had nine children that fit the bill totally. Wow. So there are a total of four families, which is wonderful. I'm yes. loving it because one family is a homeschool family. And of course, I homeschooled my grandchildren in the Macklin Wisdom School, which was a, a certified homeschool with the state of Delaware. And uh, I homeschooled them from second and third grade to college. And awesome. so this particular family with nine children, they were excited to be able to engage their children in a history camp because they're homeschooled. Right. And then we have three other families uh, who just thought it was a great idea. And the kids are really eating it up. I have been so <laughs> delighted to see how much they enjoy it. Uh, it's a lot of walking because there is a lot of history that mm -hmm. we can walk to. And so we're taking advantage of all of it. Would you like to hear a little bit about our schedule and curriculum? Oh, yeah, definitely. definitely. Let's get it out there. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, as I said, I'm sorry that we can't take any more students for this year. But just let me tell you what we're doing. Each day we have a particular area of study and so the camp is called reach for the stars history camp and on our first day and i am so thankful for my friends you can't do anything without friends and right. so i have musician friends who will be coming through i have historian mm -hmm. and actor friends who will be coming through i have connections with all of the major uh, community centers will be swimming at the YMCA and I'll be sharing the history, my involvement with the YMCA Black Achievers in Business and Industry program, as well as uh, the history that surrounds the Walnut Street YMCA, which we used to call the Black Y. And so we will be studying the history while we're swimming in the pool. So okay. <laughs> each day there's a new activity. But on the first day, we had our arrival and reach for the stars. I told them about why the camp was called reach for the stars. Then we have a word to live by. And after that, we take our reach for the stars walk. And so on the first day, we learned that we will say, I will, I can, I did, and I do. And so right from the start, we introduce what we do at our um, academy, the winning attitude program. I also offer the winning attitude program in the prison. Uh, so this is a program that redirects our thinking into positivity. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're doing, we're thinking positively. So they, I will. Can you do that? I will try. Mm -hmm. I can do that. I did it. And mm -hmm. they get excited about knowing that they don't have to shy away from things that may seem difficult. And then we went on our history tour and we called it Meeting Harriet. We went to the Tubman Garrett Park and there we met Harriet. And so they began to explore the life and times and history of Harriet Tubman and 
Thomas Garrett right here in Wilmington, Delaware. And the whole idea is to show them who they are mm -hmm. in relationship to history. And they enjoyed it very much. The walking they love, the getting out in the fresh air they love, and meeting my friends, because Harriet Tubman is one of my dearest friends, you know. And mm -hmm. then we went to the friends meeting house. And yesterday, oh, I'm sorry, on Tuesday, we met Mr. Garrett. And there we found the Underground Railroad. And uh, that was exciting. And then we come back and we, again, we have breakout sessions to talk about what we learned. But because I also enjoy writing, we write about it in our journal. Each child owns their own journal. Awesome. And during this three weeks, they will write. But not only will they write, they have enacted each day of their journey in the camp so far. So if you go on the Facebook page, Jay Macklin or the Academy for Peace, you can follow our journey in the history camp. On today, it was exciting. We started with music, the sounds of blackness. Mm. You asked about music. Right, right. And they knew right away, the family knew right away, sounds of blackness, we know that. And so they became engaged in hearing the stories of a people through music, through the sounds of blackness. So today we talked about Delaware history and how African-Americans played a part. And how did we do that? We started right on Market Street, right there at 203 Market, which is the Academy for Peace. And we moved up the street all the way walking to the Delaware History Museum. But as we walked to the History Museum, we played I Spy, and they were supposed to find plaques that told the story of the area. Now, let me tell you some of the plaques that we saw. Who knew that the very building that the Academy is in was the first Jewish settlement in the 1600s in Wilmington, Delaware. The first synagogue was open right here in this Loma district. Isn't that amazing? Did Nothing. you know that, Mr. No, Omar? No, I did not. No, I did not. In the 1600s. <laughs> this wow. block, as a matter of fact, when we to Wilmington, Delaware in 1960, this block was full of furniture stores. Oh, yeah. Cooper yeah. furniture, wax furniture, uh, and uh, office furniture, <clears throat> and the Rialto movie theater. All of that's gone now, of course. But this uh, area that we call Loma, and Loma simply stands for lower market. Did anybody know that? You hear people say the Loma district, it simply yeah. means low market. Yeah. So in this area, guess what we found? We found the Jewish settlement. We found that Abraham Lincoln, when he was a senator, came to fourth and market to what's now called Lincoln Square. The yeah. very building right there on 4th and Market that's now a chiropractic office. And we found out today that the chiropractor who owns that business is a black man. Well, wow. That many people didn't know that. And so they came out, if you go to Facebook, you'll see us taking pictures right there where Abraham Lincoln stood. He came to deliver a message before he delivered 
the Emancipation Proclamation. He was president when he delivered that message. However, when he came to Lincoln Square, right here in Wilmington, Delaware, he wasn't president yet. He was a senator from Illinois. Isn't that interesting? Right, then right. So, the yeah, big yeah. building, then the big building on the corner of Third and Market was the Farmers Bank building. The Farmers Bank building was one of the first banks in this area. And the farmers from lower Delaware used to come up, bring their fruits and vegetables and poultry and meats, and they would park on King Street between 2nd all the way up to 8th Street. And they would sell their wares and all of the people would come, what we would call from the east side uptown. I'm going uptown. Right. What were we going uptown for? To shop, to shop at those different vendors and stands that mm -hmm. sold fresh fruits, vegetables, poultry, and so forth. But they mm -hmm. needed a bank. So right there on Third and Market is the farmers bank building it's now a law firm and uh, they've done a beautiful job of refurbishing it and uh, as we walked on up the street and we got to the uh, green box vegan vegetarian restaurant i was able to tell them about the young man who opened that green box store right there on fourth and market, a young entrepreneur. But as we walked up the street, I pointed out various entrepreneurs and told them how they reached for the stars. You have to start somewhere. Like you, Mr. Omar, mm -hmm. when you came to my classes, you were just investigating and studying <laughs> how you and picking my brain. So I think it worked right, <laughs> because right. you are outstanding nowadays with books and plays and business. And you right. know, it's remarkable. Physical fitness. What else? What else don't you do? Oh uh, well, you know, you know, you only live once, so you gotta try to get you gotta live once, so you gotta try to be the best you possibly you can be. But Dr. J, we're 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 running short on time, but I want to ask you a couple I more. I can't questions. believe we're yeah. almost out of time. We can't be. Oh yeah, yeah, you, you know, you you taking all that knowledge, but one of the questions I want to ask you is that you know, when we talk about black history, um we often talk about blacks from slaves that were brought from Africa, but but people really talk about what were we what were, what were we like before slaves? Uh exactly in the curriculum. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, tomorrow we will be going to the uh, Walnut Street Y for swimming. But before that, we will complete our lesson from today and talk about who we were before slavery. Right. We started that conversation today. And of course, we know that Africa is the seat of humanity. Right. Humankind started in that alluvial river valley, the Nile River, the great Euphrates River. All of those rivers ran through Africa. Mm -hmm. And guess what? If you read the Bible, you will find those same rivers mentioned in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And so, yes, I talk about who we were before slavery. We were kings, queens, mathematicians, physicians. We were a people of wisdom, knowledge, and great wealth. And the wealth and the wisdom and the knowledge and everything that we were is still there, still a great people. And so, as we walk and as we talk and as we listen to the story, we are placing ourselves in the position of Africans before slavery. And right. then we, 
I like to say we um, are back to the future. We go back so we can run into the future right. with uh, all of the wisdom right. of the ages. Go ahead, honey. One of the things that, that, that you didn't mention that you are through, 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 through my um, observation is that you are humanitarian. I've seen you bring homeless people in to, to, to feed them. I've seen you open your doors for, for everybody, not, not just for one particular segment of people, but, but for everybody. I mean, even those who wanted to use your facility and didn't have money, you allow them to do so anyway. So just talk briefly as time, as we run out of time, talk briefly about Dr. J, the humanitarian. <laughs> well, first, I don't know what you're talking about. I just do what I can. <laughs> <laughs> because if it wasn't for the grace of God, there go I. Okay. If it wasn't for the grace of God, it could be me who would be homeless. Right. It could be I who would be without friends. It could be my family that didn't have a college education. And all of my brothers are college educated. They don't live in the state of Delaware any longer, but okay. they are all great men. One engineer, one a radio per personality in the Midwest, one uh, 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 journalist uh, worked for the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Atlanta Constitution, winner uh, of a uh, uh, nomination for Pulitzer Prize. So we have been blessed. And I thank my mother and my father who worked, taught us the value of work. And most importantly, my mother, who was the greatest humanitarian that I've ever known in that there was nothing too great that she could do for anyone. She would give her last. She would uh, speak to encourage people. Yeah. She was funny, you know, and I miss her very much. But if I had to answer your question, I would simply say, I just thank God every day when I put my feet on the ground that he has given me life, health, and strength to do what I do because of him. Right. Awesome. 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 Now, now, once again, you have the summer camp uh, currently at the Academy of Peace. Uh, so what, what, what should we look for um, in the fall, in the winter? What, what programs you got coming up? <laughs> we, we are so excited. You know, for years I did um, what we call with Annette Fletcher, our Wear Your Crown program where we uh, promote amicable relations between women and girls, just building the right attitude and, and looking forward to that. We're expanding that program with Miss Annette Fletcher. And we're also looking at two programs for our youth. One is GLAM, Glowing Ladies Attitude Models, where we model the right attitude and man is manners always needed, where we teach young men how to become gentlemen scholars. Isn't that exciting? That is awesome. So, and then we will also introduce once again, our human development program that is comprehensive. It, it, it reaches every uh, area of our lives from our finances to building, uh, home-based built businesses, uh, education, you name it, we probably will touch on it in our human development program. I just wanna show you these, Mr. Omar. Oh, okay, what we got there? These are pipe cleaners. And in reaching for the stars, one of my team leaders came to me and said, look what I make. Look at that. Those are superheroes from pipe cleaners. So we have artists in our youth group. We have fashion designers. One little girl came and said, Dr. J, do you sew? 
And guess what? I do. She <laughs> said, can you teach me to sew? I have a sewing machine, but I can't use it yet. So who knows? We might even do a sewing program this fall. I don't know. I'm open for whatever drops into my spirit. We're also going to be doing uh, inspiration, inspirational programming on Sunday afternoons and evening. So I put that on Facebook today. Please get in contact with me if you have any inspirational gifts, talents, music, spoken word, uh, you play instruments, you're in a band, you're in a choir, and you want an outlet for your expression, contact me. We have a platform for you. And we'd like to see you at the Academy for Peace. You used to come to our Super Sundays after service, Mr. Oh, yeah, Omar. Yeah, yeah. And they, aren't they awesome? Oh, it's yeah, like well, a dinner cool. theater show only uh, on inspirational steroids. <laughs> it's a big deal. So yeah. we want to invite all of the community. Come see us. Come be interviewed on our community conversations that we do monthly. Mm -hmm. We will be starting up our community conversations on the deep blue sofa starting again in September. Also, okay. what can I say? So much to say and so little time. I'll say thank you for this platform and the invitation. Okay, Dr. Dr. J, before we leave, um, you're a 501c3 nonprofit. So if people want to send donations, if they want to bring donations, they want to stop by, just to say hi, just to talk to you, how can they contact you? We would certainly welcome that. And you can always contact me at my email address. And I'll give that to you now. It's Jane, J-A-N-E, Air, A-I-R, Macklin, M-A-C-K-L-I-N, at AOL.com, Jane Air Macklin. And you can find that on our Academy for Peace page or on Facebook or J Macklin on Facebook, or you can inbox me, J Macklin. All right, Dr. J, it was a pleasure as always. I'm quite sure I'm going to be interviewing you again in future programs. I'd like to thank everybody for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. Okay, Dr. J, take, take care, and I'll, I'll be talking to you soon. God bless you, everyone, and thank you so much. And I hope you're watching. And I hope you'll stop by the Academy for Peace. Have a good night. 203 North Market Street, Washington, Delaware, 19801. <laughs> Thank right. you. Okay, God bless. Thank you.